There is endless information that you can use to help you with your stock analysis, whether it is for a new investment or for helping you monitor your current investments. One of the most important sources will obviously be the financial information provided by the company itself. What I am talking about here is their quarterly earnings reports, their press releases, any slide decks that they have, and their 10Ks and 10Qs. Every publicly quoted company will always have an investors relations section on their website where you can go and download all of this information information. When you get to the stage when you are basing your investment decisions on this financial information that the company is giving to you, you need to be aware of some tricks of the trade. These companies can use creative accounting techniques to show their income and their earnings in a better light, which can be a bit misleading if you're not paying close enough attention. So there is one set of accounting rules that all US publicly traded companies must follow. And this is the US GAAP, which stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Procedures. This is great for us because at least we know when we're comparing one company's results versus another, they are using the exact same rules. Even though we have the standard set of rules and procedures that everybody must follow, companies will often come up with their own slightly different adjusted financial measures when they communicate with shareholders. So what they might do is include or exclude certain income or expenses and have a bit of a kind of a tailored financial measure that is slightly different to what other people are reporting. You'll see what I mean now in a minute we're going to have a look at the latest Tesla quarterly earnings report. But what you really need to know is that anything that diverges from the standard gap reporting procedures needs to be called out as a non-GAAP and clearly stated as a non-GAAP financial measure. So let's have a look at the Tesla quarterly earnings now and then you'll know what I mean. We're looking at their quarterly earnings here it shows for the last uh, few quarters here you can see that they are showing here net income both in terms of gap and they also have their own non-gap measure of net income. So for Q4 2022, they had like 4.1 billion in net income using their non-gap measure and 420 million less if they use the gap procedure. So there is a bit of a discrepancy there. You'll often find that the non-gap reported measure always has kind of a better reflection on the company than than using the equivalent gap financial measure tesla have it fairly clearly stated here on their financial summary what is gap and what is non-gap but on some earnings reports that i've looked at it's kind of in the fine print down here at the bottom that they have a little reference and you have to read the very small print to figure out which one is gap and which one is non-gap but it's fairly clearly stated here on tesla's report so you can see as well for their earnings per share measure they also have a gap and non-gap earnings per share. So the gap earnings per share is $1.07 and then using the non-gap metric it is $1.19. Whenever you see information reported like this where you see a gap and non-gap version of the same metric, they always have to give you some reconciliation between both so you can know what the difference is, what's actually making up the difference between the two. And that will usually be down in the appendices of the document. So we can go and have a look at it here. For Tesla here, you can see that there is only one item that makes up the difference between their gap net income and their non-gap net income, and that is stock-based compensation. So that's the 419 million difference that we saw previously. You can definitely argue that the non-gap income is a fair representation of how the core business is performing because this stock-based compensation is really a non-cash expense. And for somebody who is just trying to look at how the core business is performing, if they were to include the stock-based compensation, that would probably distort the picture. So it's fair enough that Tesla are showing both here. At least investors have a lot more information to go on. A different problem that it might bring up though is if Tesla were using, say, non-gap measures in their forward-looking statements. How are you going to try and value the company in the future based on non-gap measures? If you are trying to value the company's growth into the future, you're going to have to decide if you're going to use the gap measures are non-gap measures that the company has reported to use in your calculations and that can add another layer of complexity and another way you could possibly get things wrong. Usually when a company is reporting non-gap net income, they are commonly excluding items such as 
non-cash expenses and non-reoccurring items so these could include items such as say if the company went through some sort of restructuring and had layoffs they might exclude all of the legal and professional costs associated with that as it is a non-recurring item that will not happen every quarter that way it is easier for you to analyze the performance of the core business in this quarter versus the prior quarter for example other costs that you might also see excluded may relate to things like mergers and acquisitions and there's going to be a whole lot of one-off costs for the whole due diligence process for acquiring another company and these could be other items that are excluded when they are reporting their non-gap net income also some non-cash items such as depreciation and amortization of intangible assets they would commonly be excluded for some of the non-GAAP financial metrics. This data that I'm showing you here is a little bit out of date, but according to auditanalytics.com, 97% of S&P 500 companies use non-GAAP metrics. So it is something that you're going to have to get used to seeing and trying to decipher which item is a gap metric and which is a non-GAAP metric. Here is an example of another earnings report. This one is for Snapchat. As you can see here, there are difference between their non-GAAP net income and their GAAP net income is quite big. It goes from a loss of 288 million to a profit of 214 million. So if you weren't paying close enough attention and you were only looking at the non-GAAP measures, you'd be thinking, okay, Snapchat is doing quite well. It's making a profit now. But in reality, Snapchat here is adding back a certain number of items. Again, stock-based compensation, restructuring charges, payroll and other taxes related to the stock-based compensation and amortization of intangible assets to come to that profit. It's kind of like them saying to their shareholders, we made a loss, but when you take this and this and this into account, we're actually doing okay. There is a bit of debate whether companies should be allowed to actually report any of these non-GAAP measures at all. But in reality, the accounting framework that we use to report financial information is, tends to be quite slow moving. And it can be a little bit outdated for the likes of tech companies and doesn't really help them to kind of accurately portray the performance of their company. So in my opinion, it's actually good that we do get to see these non-GAAP metrics as well as the GAAP metrics. Once it is fairly presented like this where you can see exactly what the difference is between the both measures and everybody is clearly aware of it, then the more information that you have, obviously, the better. Anyway, that's pretty much it for my video today. If you want to see any more videos on this topic, especially around companies' earnings reports, um, please let me know down in the comment section and I can line up a few more videos on them.